Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew McLean, and I am serving my second term in the main house. I represent part of Gorham and a small part of Scarborough, and I served on the Transportation Committee in the last session, and this year I am the chair of the Transportation Committee. Sean Mabine. <laughs> you don't know me. <laughs> I was going to say, that's the shortest thing I've ever heard. Jean Marie Caterina, oh like God. chair of the town council. Uh, Senator Amy Bulk. I represent most of Scarborough, all of Gorham, and most of Buxton. Tom Hall, town manager. Kate St. Clair, Scarborough Town Council. I'm Karen Bashan. I'm I represent House District 29, which is Coastal Scarborough, and I am a freshman legislator serving my first term, and I am on the Health and Human Services Committee. Ms. Blaze, Town Council. And I'm Jessica Holbrook, and I run the Pony Show for today. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go ahead, and um, w one of the purposes of, of reaching out and asking everybody to come here this evening was just to kind of promote some communication, some good dialogue, talk a little bit about what's going on up in your branches of government and then kind of some things that are going on here locally and um, try to improve those communications. So um, you do have in front of you um, a very loose agenda, if you will. It was just some maybe talking points for, for us to have, um, to have some discussions around. And um, the first one being um, to review sponsored legislation. So we could talk a little bit about maybe some you know, legislation that's in front of you, things that you've been sponsored, things that, that may or may not impact Scarborough, um, a little bit about what's going on in, in your branch. So I'll jump up and down. <laughs> <laughs> I brought a list. If anyone's interested, I can circulate yeah. this. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. I think there's enough for the people that are here as well. Actually, um, So while you're doing that, I don't mm -hmm. I did. I was asked by Dan Bacon, the sponsor, um, a particular bill at the town's request, and it's already been referenced. And um, I don't know whether it's been scheduled for a hearing. If not, it's going to be. It's number nine, LR eleven fifty four, and I'll have to get that LD number for you. And so my understanding of that bill is that it's um, when the state has approved the town of Scarborough to oversee a development um, permitting and so forth, correct me if I'm wrong, sure. um, then it's once that project has been completed, if then there are changes that need to be made, they wouldn't have to go back to the state to make those changes and have those changes approved. They could return to the town and, and the town would continue that process with the developer. So um, seems like great legislation and yes. hopefully we'll have the support of some other communities. I know he reached out to, I believe, Biddeford and mm -hmm. one other community. Um, and, and DAP, the, the uh, agency that oversees this process is a uh, a friend to this and will be supportive, uh, right. we understand. So, right. and just for the council's benefit, this is in furtherance of your goal to be business friendly, and mm -hmm. we've taken it upon ourselves an established municipal capacity so we can review projects locally and not have to send certain portions to the state, which causes uh, time delays and, and it costs money, so we can streamline that development review process. And this will further strengthen our local abilities to be able to do that, uh, particularly on. Uh, amended uh, site plans uh, as well as new site plan reviews. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I also sponsored LR 1066. This one's gotten a little bit of press, an act to improve safety and clarify responsibilities of pedestrians and bicyclists. And um, I was approached by um, a constituent who's actually a Scarborough resident who is an outgoing um, board chair or board president of that organization and um, these are some con continued um, tweaks to the law that they would like to see and probably Representative McLean knows a little bit more about that area. It'll go to his committee, transportation, and um, <clears throat> but I think that it goes toward, you know, helping Scarborough and other communities be more pedestrian and, and bicycle friendly and I come to that from I'm not a bicyclist but I'm a runner and, um, 
definitely have a fair amount of people yell at me while I'm out running my dog <laughs> because they don't quite understand the, the rules and so I think the more that we can talk about them and um, that, you know, awareness is heightened around those issues, it's good, so. Um, and, I don't know, does any, do any of these jump out at anybody? I, I have a question. Sure. Um, I noticed that, not, forgive me, I'm, I don't know if it's part of the budget or, or what, but uh, financing of charter schools, there's a movement underfoot. This isn't, I don't know if you're oh. in front of it, <laughs> but it's um, looking at having charter schools rather than dinging each, dinging mm -hmm. is a technical term, each t town for right. each individual student that goes to charter school, yes. that it's going to come out of the general fund. Yeah. And so I didn't know if you supported that, what your thoughts were about that. And yeah, uh, um, okay. that's supported by Maine School Management. Right. And um, I think it's going to get a lot of support. Do you support it? Yes. Okay. Because I know there's some concern about it um, then taking away from the overall amount of money that's available for schools instead of expanding what's available to schools. If you catch my address. Um, you know, we aren't yeah. thinking any schools, but right. it's another but slice it's still, of the pie. It, right. Um, and, but but there's no increase in education funding per se. So, so to, um, to I don't know for sure whether there is or not. We don't okay. have in a budget. So, um, but okay. I mean, I was I, just curious. Yeah. I, I think that the majority of superintendents and school boards are supporting it. Okay. That was my question on that. Are there any other questions for Amy about some of the LDs or the ABS things? Um, no. No, just, just on the ones that she talked about. Or, or any, any of them. them. <laughs> um, There's only a thousand of them. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I, on, quite frankly, I, I until I saw this list, I, I honestly didn't realize the magnitude of, of how much is on your plate. Um, yeah. And I know, and I do know that it gets sort of like different pieces of the pie go to different groups and 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 how that all works and stuff. But um, it's inter it's an interesting list to look at and and think about. Yeah. Um, so I think at this point I don't have anything big to add until I read through this a little bit more. Yeah. So I guess I would need a couple more minutes if you don't mind. Um, I have a. Does it refer to anything on here? Or maybe it says maybe it's hidden. <laughs> <laughs> um, towards the end of last year, there was a study conducted about the feasibility of having another casino. Mm -hmm. And f from what was item number four. And the study, I, I think, basically came back and said, yeah, I, the state could definitely uh, use another one, uh, specifically identified the southern part of the state. Mm -hmm. now, do you know of any legislation that's in the works about that? Um, uh, Representative Vashon knows a little bit more about that than I do. Uh, yeah, I, I saw specifically in the, the letter that there was a question about the 13 gaming bills. And what I want you to know is all of those bills have been submitted, but none of them have come out of the re revisor's office as, really? of, as of yet. So um, it's really hard to answer any of the questions around any of those bills because we really haven't specifically seen the language. I have read the White Sands study. I don't know. Have all of you had it? We, we circulated okay. it. We, um, saw, we, we saw, I, I only saw bits and pieces of it. So basically you're saying that it's been looked at, it's been submitted, but there is no recommendation, formal recommendation yet? Is that? I, I haven't seen the bill I at all come it? out of the revisor's what? office. Hmm. So there and, isn't any. And it hasn't been sent to committee yet. So, you know, it has, hasn't been heard. Yeah, Karen, have you put some, did you put something in, did I see? Yes, I, um, Can you talk about I, I submitted, I submitted three bills, all of which none have, have yet to come out of the revisor's right. office. But um, just so you understand this yeah, thank you. is, because it's confusing, you know, yeah. I, I 
was elected, and then before we even open up session, we have to have all of our, our bills in. So if you can imagine 66 <laughs> new freshman legislators out of a total of 151, all of us elected to go to Augusta and put our, our legislation in, everybody's just submitting their bills um, for their initiatives that they heard on the campaign trail or at the request of a constituent or, or an interest. So um, Scarborough Downs did ask me to submit a bill, which I submitted, it's LR 1174, and it is an act to ensure fair competition by and between main commercial tracks. Um, so so that, that is the bill. I'm still waiting for it to come out of the, the revisor's office. So that was submitted on request. Um, the other two bills that, that I submitted, one was centered around the Affordable Care Act, and it's probably going to be very, very complicated for all of you, um, but essentially when an applicant um, that is a family that is under 200% of federal poverty level applies, puts in an application for, through healthcare.gov, the children are automatically sent to, to main care. And a lot of people have said, you know what, we don't want main care. We would rather have a subsidized premium tax credit private health insurance plan. So the bill that I submitted was around giving them, them a choice. And as I got up there and started looking around at the Affordable Care Act and also the issues coming through the Department of Health and Human Services, I kind of looked and said, we probably need to go back and, and revisit that. So once you've submitted a bill into the revisor's office, you're waiting for the language to come back and then, then you can adjust and, and adapt it. Um, and then, then the, the third bill is a bill, and I can't remember the exact wording, I'm waiting for it to come out, but it's along the, the lines of fair and equal access of political candidates um, when you're, you're campaigning in um, apartment complexes that, that have a, um, a um, do not trespass. Yeah, the do not tra trespass, um, no soliciting. Right. No solicitation, yeah. right? Condo developments yeah, do that. Yeah, around that. And, and that, was, that was because I got one third of the way through one and was, was thrown out. And then I started looking at, at other states and other laws and what, what they did. I didn't want so. to throw me out. <laughs> it is I've just said, I'm a candidate. I'm not telling anything. Right. I just want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it clarifies the difference between solicitation and campaign. Yeah. And but that, I, but we're, that's good. We're, right? still, yeah. we're still waiting for the language to come out. But yeah. basically, I looked at, at um, Minnesota had oh. done a very specific law around, around mm -hmm. that. So I'm waiting, waiting for that to come oh, back. Good. So could you talk a little bit just so... Um, for all of us that aren't familiar with how it works. So you submit and yep. go to the revisor's office yep. and then walk us through kind of the time ballpark, I'm sure, timetables and processes of how it, how it comes back. So you I will try, <laughs> and but I will tell you I am still on that learning curve. So my colleagues, actually I, I, I will turn that over to, to my colleagues because I'm in the process right now of learning that. Yes, can I, ask you, can I ask her a question that goes with that real quick sure. so she could include it? Is there a limit on how many they how many you can submit? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> Unlimited, for better or for worse. No, I was just like thinking along those. So, yeah. go ahead. Well, Sorry. Representative McLean, I don't know if you want to describe the process or do you want me to do it? I'm happy to talk about it and okay. chime and in. Talk about your bills. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I, first of all, I commend Karen for only putting in three. <laughs> um, you know, but when you're chair of a committee, you get asked to put in exactly. many, many more. Yeah, so. a lot of my bills were. And so if I was asked to submit. Yeah. And, and it is a lot of work to carry a bill forward. So, you know, you submit the bill, <clears throat> you submit it to the revisor's office, you submit the title. The revisor's office is, this, is the office that creates the statutory language uh, of the bill. And they'll bring you the bill back, and then you go get co-sponsors for it. Um, there is a public hearing that is scheduled, um, and you have to give the public two weeks' notice. It's put in put in newspapers to advertise. The public hearing takes place a week or two later. There's usually a work session on it where the committee 
um, actually works the bill and talks about it as a committee. There's no public testimony that's heard at that point in time, um, but if the committee wishes, folks from the public can come up and offer suggestions or comments during that time. So the work session occurs. Um, sometimes there are multiple work sessions depending on the the um, the uh, the bill and whether or not it's either controversial or it needs more work. The committee ends up voting it out. Um, and there are several different ways a committee can vote out a bill. It can vote it straight ought to pass. Um, it can vote it ought not to pass. It can vote it ought to pass as amended. Um, and there are a couple other kind of funky ways that we can vote out uh, a bill, and I can't recall them off the top of my head. But um, then the bill goes to the floor of the House or the Senate, and it typically goes to the floor of, of the chamber of the person who introduced the bill. So if if Senator Volk introduced the bill, it would go to the Senate first and vice versa. And then uh, the House takes, or the Senate takes a vote on it, gets flipped to the other chamber, and then it goes to the executive branch. So usually, unless it's not passed. Mm -hmm. Anything else? There are usually more than one That's sponsor, the, though, to bills, correct? What was that? There's usually more than one sponsor on it. There are co sponsors, yeah. So if you were to yeah. say an average timetable, I, I know because I'm thinking in my head at home the people that have already heard Casino mm -hmm. and there's something in the works. Maybe mm -hmm. it's not where it needs to be, but, yeah. but it's in the works. Um, you know, would it be an understatement to say it's a year-long process, or as an average, or is it six months? Is it? We have to be done. Uh -huh. We have a we have a deadline, a statutory adjournment. So we have to be done by is it 17th or 19th of June? June 17th. We yeah. have to be done by. So every bill <laughs> has to be voted out um, <clears throat> by that time. Well. And can be carried well, there are a few that can be carried over, over yeah. right? But in large part, of those 1,700 bills, 1,670, mm -hmm. 1,650 will have to be voted on. So you can imagine what you have to know and learn in a very short amount of time, you know? Because we're um, really just starting to have hearings. So I think only only like 450 bills have been sent out to committee. Mm -hmm. So there's still a lot including all of mine sitting in the revisor's office just waiting to come out. Waiting to be written, yeah. So it's it's a fairly long process. And where, where I mean, this, these gaming bills really, I mean, those that relate to the White Sands study actually really, if you think about it, originated with the 126th mm -hmm. legislature when they authorized the study, you know, spent $150,000 on it. And now, you know, people have had a chance to look at the study and submit language based upon the results of that study or not. You know, again, haven't seen the bill. So to Councillor uh, Blaze's point, there are some 13 titles that have been submitted. Yeah. Again, I'm not aware that anything's come out of the revisor's office. Mm -hmm. um, the difference this year, though, is that the Legal and Veterans Affairs Committee, who is who's the committee that will hear all of these 13 and have heard all previous, I believe, uh, gaming-related bills, um, has actually shown leadership by conditioning the study. And the study was fairly detailed. Uh, I'll circulate it back around mm -hmm. if anyone's interested, but it essentially lays out a framework, uh, yeah. a process, uh, which has been sorely absent in mm -hmm. all prior attempts. Right. And right. so what we've seen is individual interests uh, bringing forward uh, first Hollywood slots and then more recently Oxford uh, really tailored for that specific yeah. fight. Um, so there is a framework and that's, a, that's different than it's ever been. And I think why that's important to this council, though I, I know that there are uh, very diverse opinions about this, mm -hmm. this issue, um, if the legislation takes the sort of uh, approach that many of the bills last session took, uh, those bills may be very, very specific and actually dictate financial sharing of proceeds and should ultimately Scarborough be a location for this facility, we would be remiss not to be aware and maybe even be engaged in this process. It doesn't mean we're supportive, but we should be aware of what, how we might be affected uh, should it come to pass. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the ultimate failsafe in our ordinance, and I, I'm certain will be in state law, the governor certainly said it countless times, that it's, it will be a local choice regardless of whether it's permitted at the state level. So. Um, there should be some comfort associated with that, regardless of how this shakes out. Local referendum is will still be uh, a central component, a requirement of that process. I think the governor's actually said 
countywide. I think that's, oh, that's really? his Yeah, point. he did. I, think, I believe he talked about county as opposed yeah. to town. Well, at the very least, it seems but, to me that uh, we have a, a local right. requirement in our land use that requires yeah. town votes. So right. maybe it's yeah. county and town. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll have to see how it comes out. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to mention something, especially since we're on TV. You know, the, the process of developing and uh, taking public comment on, on legislation, frankly, I, Maine is very open and transparent. And when a bill is, is developed and created from the revisor's office, folks can go on the legislature's website and look at all the bill titles. They can look at them by sponsor. They can look at them by subject matter. So if folks want to do a search or look into what, who's doing what and what's being done by whom, um, people can look at that. Um, we have to give several weeks notice uh, for every public hearing that takes place. Um, when we conduct a public hearing, every person's testimony is counted. We don't reject anyone. Anyone who comes to the committee room uh, or anyone who wants to send us testimony is incorporated into that public hearing. And so we have a very open and transparent process, a very inclusive process of anyone who wants to participate. Mm -hmm. And I think that that speaks volumes about our legislature and the state of Maine and what we value. So I would encourage those of people who have strong feelings about any particular issue um, to come forward, come to Augusta, or reach out to any one of us um, to, to help them take part in, in that process. So. Did you have bills? Oh yeah, I do. A couple. Before we, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah, mean that. I was just gonna ask him because he hasn't talked. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been going kind of around. I'll like, just talk about you it. You've got to say, and you better have something in there for North Scarborough. No, I'm North Scarborough. <laughs> <laughs> just, just for you, Jim. Um, something about regulating uh, honey. No. Well, it depends on which one it is. Just kidding. Um, oh. <laughs> um, so, not surprisingly, I have a lot of bills about transportation-related items. Um, you know, I, I think the one uh, I've been asked to submit a lot of bills, you know, including the Maine Turnpike Authority's budget, um, the governor's highway fund supplemental budget, um, uh, a couple other ones from the Turnpike. Um, but the the two that I'm, or the two or three that I'm really looking forward to, to talking about, is um, is a study commission that I want to start. Um, because we are in desperate need of investment in our transportation infrastructure. Um, every year we underfund our transportation system by a minimum of $180 million. Uh, this is money that is not developed by uh, a politician. This is what the engineers in the DOT are saying that we need to make sure that the bridges we travel over are safe and the roads are not destroying our cars. Um, we need to be investing in our rail lines, our airports, our seaports. It's critical for our economy. And um, right now, every year, we lose money um, in our highway fund for, for several reasons. One is we have increasing fuel efficiency in our cars. Um, we're not keeping up with inflation. Uh, the indexing of the gas tax was repealed several years ago. Um, and that has, uh, that has been another uh, leg of the stool that has been kicked out from underneath the highway fund. Um, and there's an incredible inequity in the system. So someone drives a Prius, no offense to those who drive Priuses, but those folks are getting a really good deal when they drive on the roads. Those folks who are driving trucks um, are paying a lot more than those who are driving Priuses. So we need to develop an equitable and sustainable funding mechanism so we can maintain and repair um, our roads and bridges, but also invest for the future. Um, you know. It, goes without saying, I also represent Gorham, and there's a, there's a bottleneck in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, I think everyone's driven through that. So those are the type of transformational projects that we need to make sure we have the resources to do and facilitate over the next 10 to 20 years in our region. So that's, that's why I've introduced this study. I'm optimistic or hopeful that um, I know the governor recognizes that we have a big need in our transportation system, um, and I'm hopeful that, that he'll... Um, he'll go along with this. I've also put in a bond to assist with um, our transportation infrastructure. Um, and the, the other semi-non-related transportation uh, bill that I have put in um, is about property taxes. 
and essentially or the crux of it is to increase the homestead exemption um, for all people, not just seniors. Um, and, and it would do a couple other things, but um, that will be one part of the larger, larger uh, tax reform conversation that goes on um, this year. But when I went and knocked on doors, you know, in 2012 and 2014, um, when folks were talking to me about the challenges uh, that they face, Frankly, it wasn't the income tax. Right. Um, it wasn't the sales tax. It's the property tax. Mm -hmm. It's the killer. Mm -hmm. It's the killer for people. And um, there are a lot of young families who are struggling to make it. And uh, for me, the property tax is the biggest um, uh, inhibitor of uh, young families and and you know middle low to middle income families making it in our cities and towns. So. Um, those are a few of the issues that I'm putting forward and certainly look forward to hearing from everyone on those issues and, and working on them. Right. Any, any questions about some of those bills for Well, yeah. <laughs> so, um, it's, not, it's not sexy. I'm finding that out very quickly. Uh, if I might add a question slash a comment, I'm not sure. I, I know for us locally, we, we've had some issues with some state-owned roads, mm. and, and uh, knowing that the funding's not there, we've on our own engaged in, you know, trying to reach out and saying, well, you know, what could you give us, and, and we invest our annual road maintenance mm -hmm. in repairing those roads. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see that kind of continuing those types of relationships continuing continuing in the future, or are you? looking at some of this revamping of the transportation would take care of some of this problem that we run into. So can you reframe your question? The relationship as it exists, are you hoping that that continues between the state and local? Well, both, well, but I mean, I would hope you still help us pay that to some of those roads, but uh, are, are some of the initiatives you're working on, I know you said it's been underfunded, mm -hmm. so is that reinstating the funding? Would we be able to expect that? longer having to invest in the state roads or? Well, you know, I, I can't promise anything, but it, what I can say is it, it's not going to get, um, it's not going to get better if we don't um, have some real conversations about the needs of our roads and bridges and our infrastructure in our state. So um, uh, the DOT, to its credit, I think does a really good job of taking the politics out of the building of our roads and bridges. Mm -hmm. They have put forward an aggressive plan um, that that identifies the high high priority roads, right? Um, the the roads that get most of the traffic, the roads that get most of the wear and tear. They put those kind of at the forefront of of their projects, their investments. And so it's not, you know, Andrew's the chair of the of the transportation committee and so, you know, he gets you know, a couple extra projects here. That's not how it works. You know, the politics has really been taken out of that that process, and so it's really a what needs to get done. Um, and so the roads that are and the bridges that are getting done and repaired are really the most the most critical in the state. And so um, there are more there are there are more roads and bridges that need to be fixed than we have the money for right now. Oh, I don't you doubt know? that. And so, <laughs> I don't doubt that. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Not really, but, but um, that's okay. <laughs> 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 the short answer is no. Just on that point, I, I see the problem being twofold. One, the, the, uh, certainly the trend has been and will likely continue that more and more yeah. state-owned bridges and roads are now local responsibilities. So we're picking up that responsibility. Two, those roads and bridges that are state responsibility, there's such a backlog, and Scarborough by our own choice, have chosen to invest local dollars in state roads because we, we don't want to wait for the state to do the work. Yeah. It will be decades <laughs> in some cases, we've been told. And, and so that's kind of the, the as I view it, the, the two ways it's affecting our local um, our local budget, frankly. Yeah. And we've been doing that for many years, right? Yeah, over the last 10 years, we've been increasingly yeah. taking a, on a larger role in that, in that way. Mm -hmm. I know we had to do, since I've been here, we wound up 
partnering with the state, but, but right. we wind up having to take on broad terms and to do that. Home on drove. Level, home drove, uh, feature drove. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So that, that was, yeah. well, I mean, I appreciate it in the grand scheme of a mm -hmm. bridge that yeah. we're even starting to mm -hmm. rust off from. Um, but it does come up, you know, I know Beatrice was considered a life safety issue mm -hmm. and at that point. And I'll, I'll give DOT credit, given the limited funds and some of the limited staff, I mean, they're just a shell of themselves, uh, their former selves in many respects. Sure. Um, they re react very, very positively when a community shows commitment and, and it has a willingness to spend local dollars. They uh, very often find a way to match or partner in that project, and we've been quite successful in that regard. But I think, too, it helps us understand, you know, if, if we have to take on a different role because there's not a long-term change that you see anybody foresees, then perhaps when we do our budgeting, if we're only budgeting now our annual road maintenance with the consideration that it's town-owned roads and it's not going to be that anymore, maybe that's something that needs to change. Yeah. Can I can I just jump in there one more time? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I guess the last thing I'll say about that is, I think one of the problems about this issue is that it's not a sexy topic, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, every three years we spend about two billion dollars on our transportation infrastructure, and people say, "Good Lord, you know, how are we not fixing everything with that amount?" <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but our transportation system is incredibly yeah. expensive. New Hampshire is a third of the size. They have a third of the number right. of road miles that we do. Right. Um, and so naturally, uh, we are going to, it's going to cost a little bit more to, to maintain our system in our state. But, you know, I also think that it's important folks understand where this money comes from and where it goes to. And it comes from two primary sources. One is the gas tax, the state gas tax, but also the federal gas tax. The other are registration fees from the, um, and licensing fees and stuff like that through the main, um, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. There's a real misconception amongst folks that that money is going to health care or education or other pots. That money that we take in through the gas tax and through licensing is constitutionally dedicated to the highway fund, which is in and of itself the pot of money that funds our roads and bridges. Not a cent of that is used for education or health care or anything like that. So it is strictly and constitutionally dedicated for our roads and bridges, and I think that that's really important for people to understand um, that, that that money is not only not being wasted, it is being stretched as far as it can go right now. So the state, the legislature then can't touch that pot of money. That's, that's correct. Yep, yep. And actually, I'm like, I'm like other pots of money. <laughs> that's correct. Okay. <laughs> And this is not a main problem either, uh, specifically. It's a right. problem sure. that the oh, states yeah. all over the country, mm -hmm. I believe, are grappling yeah. with, especially with more fuel efficiency. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's too bad because rebuilding infrastructure can create jobs. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those construction jobs are good paying jobs. So, so we're going to scoot along to uh, item number two, which is an interesting topic, I'm sure which will be state budget proposal. Um, as you know, and, and well, I know you weren't able to receive it, but um, we do have a resolution that talks a little bit about the budget and some of our concerns. Uh, but certainly we'd love to, to hear um, from you guys, maybe a little bit about what some of your thoughts are, what, what you see is um, good, what you see is bad, and how that may or may not impact us. Um, so I'm gonna jump in and dive off. Just for you. Um, well, I mean, I don't think that it's a secret that I've been a proponent of tax reform for a long time. So, um, you know, in general, I'm really happy that we're having a serious conversation about um, this issue. And, um, you know, that said, we have no idea what the final um, budget is going to look like or even if it will include tax reform because, um, you know, the governor has put together and submitted his budget and, all that is is a proposal. Um, it hasn't even had its first public hearing. It's been sent to appropriations, and um, you know they will do with it as they will. Each committee comes in and talks about its own budget, um, and you know looks at the governor's proposal, and then you know the larger issues of the tax reform and um, the restructuring. 
who knows what that's going to look like. So, you know, it kind of goes back to our earlier discussion of this is going to take many months. I believe the goal for them is um, May 15th to mm -hmm. have the budget voted out. Great. Um, Senator, yes, and that's in the past because... the late, late June. Right. right. Well, that's the goal. Yeah, that is... Well, <laughs> Senator Hamper seems very committed to it, hence Representative Soraki still being there. Um, she is on appropriations. She's a great person to talk to, um, you know, about this because she, of the three of us, of the four of us, will have the most influence in that, in that discussion. I have a, I have a quick question because I know you were on the Gang of Eleven, is that what mm -hmm. it was called, with yeah. uh, former Senator Woodbury. Right. Um, of the of the legs of the um, tax, so-called tax reform, and I agree with you. I mean, mm -hmm. we need to reform taxes in this state. My, of course, my personal concern is going too far away from progressive to regressive taxation. Mm -hmm. But between um, the sales tax, the income tax, and property taxes, what do you think is a good mix? Well, I mean, I, the three-legged stool model is a third, a third, a third. Right. Is that what you would look for in this? or? Um, and I would ask that would that be the ideal, I suppose, <laughs> but I have, you know, I mean, we'll only have a yes or no vote on the final budget. Um, right, but but personally, what do you support? What is it now? It's, uh, we had a thing with the numbers. It's uh, it's off balance right now. 40, something like 40-something well, like percent is, is the property. You, ha you have it in... You were uh, it was like 46% yeah. 46, 46 was property, property tax. tax. And, but anyway, I, I'm, I was just curious, you know, what your thoughts were, because I know back on that Gang of Eleven, you seem to be pretty supportive of a more balanced approach. Yeah, and um, I mean, I would I would support an idea like in in our for example in our proposal mm -hmm. we had a um, I believe it was a fifty thousand dollar homestead exemption, right? And that phased out with income that right. was for that was for everybody, um, and so I don't know if that's similar to what Representative McLean is is proposing, but I mean I would I would potentially support right. something like that. Yes. Um, you know, obviously um, I support having. Um, you know, some sales tax credits to offset for low-income mm -hmm. filers um, because they will be paying increased sales right. taxes, and we right. don't we don't want to we want to somehow try to help right. the regressivity of some of those taxes, yes. and that's the way that that happens. Okay. But um, yeah. you know, without <laughs> yeah, it's without really hard to, con I know. to conjecture what the final right. version of the budget is. Uh, Representative Ashron, if I could ask you, to put you on the spot. Then. That's fine. Um, I I am a type of person that will look at something and say, if this isn't working, maybe we should take a good hard look at sweeping change and radical redesign. Um, so I am I am not a tax expert. Um, however, I have looked at Maine's demographics, and I will say, just like Andrew and Amy, on the campaign trail, um, property taxes, mm -hmm. seniors, seniors crying at, at the door. Um, you know, property taxes at all ages, but especially um, seniors, is, is what I would say is the, the biggest, biggest concern for our town, but it seems to be with you know every every community so you kind of take a look back at that and say what do we need to do to fix this and you know you look at Maine you say hey our, we're the oldest state in the nation with a median age I think it's 42.3 years years of age Maine needs to grow I think our um, our death rate exceeds our our birth rate and you know if we think we've got problems right now um, with our seniors Get worse it and is just going to get worse. We are we are looking at at Medi Medicaid spend down right now that is going to going to fall on the on on the burdens of health and human services, um, way more so than what we're looking at right now. I think that this is just the start of things. So I will say that I do admire the governor taking a bold step to look at doing something different. Um, as to how this plays out in the budget, I would recommend that everybody keep an open mind. 
um, pay attention to some of the things that he's changed, that he's proposing. Um, this forum right here, having a workshop and being open to communication and working together really works for me. I look at this and say this is this is really just the beginning. Um, and and I, I think we need to keep the communications open and, and take a good hard look at this. Um, but you know what we're looking at for the governor's proposal versus what we're going to be voting on in yeah. May could be really, really different. But I, I think it's worth it to take a good look. Uh, Represent oh, I'm sorry. I would just point out um, you talked about the governor's proposals being bold. It's, it's really not that different than what we've seen. I think the right. last time tax reform came forward in 2009 is eerily similar to right. the basic uh, building blocks of, of this proposal in front of us. So it's certainly high time that we finally do something. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'd hate to be here 10 years from now mm -hmm. with the situation even worse and we still haven't done anything. But there's decades of blue ribbon right. commissions that have been right. Right. Mm -hmm. demanding this for 20, and 30 years. Right? And a lot of other states that have, that are, you know, either have completely eliminated or are on their way to eliminating their income tax. It's not like well, sadly, Maine is doing this alone. If we don't do something in within the next 10 years, we're going to lose a good majority of the people that live in this town because, Young they, can't people. because they can't afford it. And it's not just our senior citizens. Right. Yeah. Andrew, I'm sorry. You wanted to answer the question, yeah. please. I uh, one of the things that I've learned is that um, in order for anything big to get done, you have to have strong executive leadership. Um, and I think it's great that we're having this conversation. That the governor has put it forward. You know, I think it is really important to take a wait and see approach and let these things kind of come out in the public and stuff, and have a public conversation and a statewide conversation about uh, what we want to see in the budget and, and, and how we want um, our tax structure to be in the future. There are some things that I'm really concerned about. Um, you know, the elimination of the revenue sharing, um, mm. uh, that would be devastating uh, to cities and towns. Um, the tax on nonprofits, I don't quite understand it. I think that if we were, if we were to eliminate revenue sharing, which I have serious reservations about. I don't think a nonprofit tax is the way for cities and towns to get that back. I think if we were to even think about doing something like that, we should give cities and towns the option to do a local option sales tax. Um, to me, that's just common sense. Um, that's not taxing anyone. That's giving you all the permission to, to lev uh, levy an, a, a local option sales tax. Um, so for me, that's about local control. Um, you know, I, I honestly, I think there is room to reduce the income tax uh, for folks. Mm -hmm. There are two things I'd be concerned about. I don't support the elimination of an income tax. Mm -hmm. um, I think an income tax is important to maintaining progressivity um, and making sure we don't starve our um, state of, of the needed services. Um, and. Uh, I want to make sure that we that we maintain uh, progressivity. Um, I don't want to see low and middle income people suffer uh, because property taxes have to go up because we don't have enough money to fund the services on the local level. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I'm worried about. Thankful we can have this conversation, but set, definitely have some serious reservations. Misty Fry, thanks for your long, yeah. <laughs> We're doing good today. We're on the busy afternoon with Revenue and Sharon. <laughs> Must be beat. Um, and do you have a copy? Sure. Uh, so, well, well, she gets a copy, and, and real quick, before I forget, um, I, I know there were two counselors this evening that um, unfortunately couldn't be with us. Um, one of them was Bill Donovan, and he did um, forward over just some thoughts that he had wanted to um, share at the workshop. Mm -hmm. If I could um, just read, read what it was, was that um, he's concerned about any changes at the state level um, should do two things, be revenue neutral to towns and reduce reliance on or at least not exasperate reliance on progressive taxes. If our delegation could offer their views on those points, I would appreciate it. Hope you welcome them. 
Survival <laughs> <Bible> weather. <laughs> He's in some place much nicer right now, <laughs> like warm and yeah, sunny. Uh, but it just uh, that, uh, and that the point of needing consistency, the town needs consistency. So um, again, I just wanted to kind of share that 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 was something you needed to brought to attention. Um, I have my own thoughts, which I'll come back to on, on the state budget proposal and our resolution, but um, just real quick, was there anything you wanted to add on this? No. no? Kate? No, I'll, and I know Representative Sorky just arrived. My big question was what your views are on the budget, on the proposed budget, because um, I spoke about how I'm glad to see we're going to have some tax reform. I'm very happy about that. But the, uh, the balance of it, and our concern is counselors on increasing property taxes. So we were just looking for your thoughts, each one of the, and where you, what, you, what your beliefs are on that. The so others have answered already. I'm putting you on the floor, <laughs> <form, sorry. laughs> <laughs> No, that's okay. I expected it. <laughs> um, as far as the, the budget goes, it is in proposal form, right. and we just started hearings on it, so there's nothing written in stone by right. any means. And at the end of the day, first it passes through the Appropriations Committee, and then, it's, right. then it goes for a full vote, and I don't know that I have a real sense for how Democrats or the Republicans are really feeling at this point about the, the budget as a total. I'm not even sure what will happen with the tax reform piece. Right. So it's really hard to nail it down because we haven't, we haven't even dealt with or had one vote on even one piece of right. the proposal yet. So it's very difficult. Well, I was kind of looking for your own, your thoughts as, as, a, as a legislator as to where you stand uh, with this. Well, my personal feeling on it is, again, it's really hard to to nail down where we are because we don't, we just don't have enough information yet. Things are still, people talk about amendments, it's hard to nail down in general. I, I would say that I think there's, um, there's probably more of a um, support for some kind of tax reform. I don't know what that will be. Mm -hmm. And today there was a lot of uh, discussion about revenue sharing and um, we, we still have to weigh all the pros and cons on that. I was the turnout on that. I, w I, w had, to good, I had to work. So I no, it was, a, it was a very good turnout. <laughs> we started at 1 and I left at um, 5.30. And Actually, I was surprised was still you going, left. So. Oh, they were still going? Yeah, they, they, it was almost wrapped up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so real quick, just on this topic, and, and so the, the topic was state budget proposal, and of course that, um, we also had a resolution. I'm not sure sure that we will as a council will be taking up a little later today um, that should have been forwarded out to, out to you as well. I don't have it, an extra copy at the moment. Did you see it? Did you get it? You had a chance to see it. Um, Came by an email from Tony yesterday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, with everybody, but. Um, so just my, my two cents, if I might add, um, to, to kind of where, where I'm at as a counselor and, and, and you know certainly you guys will have your fun and play and tweak and do all your things that you do and your processes that you have. Uh, what I am really concerned about and, and um, Steve Marie works very diligently um, along with myself and Tom on our resolution this evening. Um, one of the main concerns that I do have is um, and my husband will kill me for saying this, I am for I'll be the first one to say it. I make well under the average possible medium and I'm come for Scarborough. Um, and that's really no different than many of my neighbors. Um, so the loss of the homestead exemption mm -hmm. is, it, it hurts. And um, I know realistically, you know, it, it, it's a tax. Right out the gate on my property taxes before I even get the tax bill out, out of what it's going to cost to continue services. Um, so. I, I you know, certainly don't think that is out of the question to say it's concerning, you know, to, to lose the homestead exemption, to know you may or may not lose parts of the revenue sharing, that, that in itself right there, knowing nothing else, I know your taxes and your property tax bill is a lot, period. It, even if we 
maintain flat budgets. <laughs> it, it wouldn't matter. It's going to go up um, before we even talk about what our local needs are. Um, so it's concerning, you know. So that, that, that that's some of what the resolution talks about. We're really concerned about the loss of the homestead mm -hmm. exemption underneath um, 65 and below. Although in some ways it's really nice to see that you are going to be looking to help. 65 and up because they are fixed income and then mm -hmm. have been hurt the worst mm -hmm. over the last few years. Um, I do completely understand the wait and see and you have to see where it shakes out and, and what parts kind of come together. Um, I'm quickly reading my notes, don't mind me. Um, of course the revenue sharing, like I said, is, is a little bit of a concern. Um, the tax on the nonprofit, um, it, it, I, I know you touched a little bit on this, that sometimes kind of I, I cringe again a little bit because I wonder if it has the impact that you're looking to achieve. I, I know in myself in Scarborough, I'm thinking of you know, what what would that do to a nonprofit, and are you crippling it at that point? I, I mean, if it goes away, then that is a bigger disservice sometimes. Um, and, and I don't know if there's an impact on this, but I'll use an example that you know, a reporter had asked me, what's that do to the land trust? Mm -hmm. They're one of our largest landowners. If we start taxing the couple hundred acres they own, is that land trust property anymore, or are we forcing them into a horrible position? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, to have those things in the back of your mind, you know, is it just a stringent as you will tax a nonprofit, or can we as a local municipality have a little more say in how we pick and choose to apply that to. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the last thing is, is I, I would just hope that if you come to a point where you know that the municipal revenue sharing piece, and again, there's lots of pieces to your guys' mm -hmm. budget. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, um, no kidding. Tell me about this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have a summary it, here for you. And I brought it just in case you didn't show yeah. up. So we got double, uh, double hits. Not, not light reading. Well, be a few copies. But if you could, in the back of your mind, I, I know it's an initiative that I know finance has worked on or is working on this year. It, it, it's not a blind, mm -hmm. you're, we're not going to give you this much. It's okay, you have this initiative. And maybe we can't move forward with that, or we can't fund that like we used to. So, again, you know, as you're thinking about the revenue sharing piece, if you could think about the mandate that maybe comes and feeds that, mm -hmm. you know, we, we as a municipality have certain things that yeah. we are asked to, to perform. Mm -hmm. um, a, a small, insignificant thing would be, for instance, not insignificant. Sorry, I will use, <laughs> I'll use those words later. Um, each municipality is required to have an animal control officer. Well, would you be willing to let us have maybe a regional position mm -hmm. and not mandate us to have that as an individual community? You know, so again, you know, when we talk about the revenue sharing pieces yes. to fund these, these man type mandates that we have, um, can you work with us a little bit to maneuver around some of those? Um, so that's, that's I, um, if, I was just going to say, if you don't mind, we received a, a list of sorts from one municipality today of the mandates or of concern. If you have specific um, suggestions like, like what you had just mentioned, that would be great. So it's we helpful can certainly to provide us. a list of state mandates that uh, for services that we provide locally that is actually state requirement, but we do it. And it's a great segue. I think that's basically the tone of the resolution. I encourage right. you all to take a look at it. But Essentially, it, it uses the governor's words, and I, I, I believe in them, that mm -hmm. services are better, best rendered at the level of government closest to the people. Mm -hmm. That's us. Uh, but we need help doing it. Uh, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. and, and some of those mandates actually <laughs> are good mandates. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why we receive revenue sharing over the years was not, uh, not only to reduce the regressivity of the property tax, but to help municipalities pay for delivering, you know, mm -hmm. animal control, salt <coughs> sheds, uh, shoreland zoning, code enforcement. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole long list of things that over the years that are good. They're good things, and they're, it's right that they are performed by the municipalities, but help us out with this. Mm -hmm. We want to do it, yeah. but hello. <laughs>
Yeah, we're going to. We're going yeah, to we got <laughs> well, the next step. Uh, we will run a little late into our, into our council meeting. Uh, I will, what I'll say is we'll probably start at 7.15, so just with that mindset in the back, back of everybody's mind, because at 7.15 we'll stop this workshop, and then they'll need 10 minutes, if I'm not mistaken, to rewire mm -hmm. for, for council meeting. Uh, I believe you had something. I just had a question. Sure. So one of the things that I've been hearing and reading about is that with the proposed elimination of revenue sharing, um, it's up to the cities and towns. They don't have to raise taxes on, on mm -hmm. folks, right? That's, that's their choice, and if they choose to raise taxes, mm -hmm. that's their choice alone. Um, and I'd like to know, maybe this is a question for Tom, but I'd like to know your reaction to that, that sentiment. And if that's a reality, if, if raising taxes is an option. It's an option, you. but I think it's terribly naive. It, it uh, avoids the critical discussion that to do so, you need to cut services. And, and that's an important uh, conversation that will hurt people locally. So mm -hmm. I think it's conveniently uh, simple, but I think it's terribly short-sighted. Uh, and it's not part of the, the full equation. It certainly is an option, but it's an option with great consequence. The siloed opinion. You know, I think, I mean, so, uh, when that statement's made, um, Tom is absolutely correct. Uh, the statement is absolutely correct, by the way. We don't mm -hmm. have to oh, raise yeah. taxes, but what are we going to lose and who are we going to lay off? And in a community as big as Scarborough and given its mass, um, you, we can't afford to cut services. I might piggyback on that, um, and I, the school is slightly different, but, but for us, we're talking municipally on, on our town side of things and municipal revenue sharing. Um, Scarborough's municipal budget has actually been flat, which is a, a monumental task in itself for a five-year period. So th th it's pink slips. It, it's not if we choose to tax it or not. That's pink slips. There, there, there's no way around it. That's, you know, firefighters that we already don't have enough of. That's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, that's... And to just put a finer point, it's $725,000 is what our roughly what our current allocation for revenue, uh, municipal revenue sharing, which has been a decreasing amount but the current budget is 725. One of the things that I do like about um, the, what the governor proposed is he's got funding for municipalities to be able to explore ways in which they can um, work with other municipalities and I know Scarborough's been exploring that um, we do it. We do. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But I think that you know, um, when you consider the way most municipalities um, outside of New England are run, I think there's still a lot more work that could be done um, in terms of um, you know looking at countywide. And um, so I, I do like that this budget includes some money for that. And I think that that's important for people to know. Um, I, think I, don't, I don't think it'll be enough, uh, and I and I under, I don't know. I get like, fr I get frustrated because I hear this push. You know, th there's talk on one side about consolidation or working together or whatever, but yet we've had school consolidation was a nightmare, and we've got a lot of schools divorcing now right. because but they that don't was, like that. That was a top-down approach. This is mm -hmm. more of a bottom-up approach, and so I think that it empowers municipalities to, you know, do things on their own terms and explore things on their own terms rather than being told from Augusta, this is how we want you to do it. So I think that's important. I think it's mm -hmm. important whether we maintain revenue sharing or not because it's, I mean, if you look at the history of revenue sharing, it's been shrinking for many, many, many years, way Four before years. this administration. Four I've got the numbers Five right years. here. Yeah, I got them. I think that's a good, that's, I'm sorry, that, I think that was a good, that, that's a very good point because, you know, for years and, you know, so the, the question is going to be is that this still could become a, a cluster mess and the reason is because municipalities will look on their own to develop those relationships when they could go through their county government and have a greater reliance on county government providing services and being the conduit for those relationships because otherwise we're just off doing our, all still doing our own thing costing more money. Right. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. So I mean, it needs to be done in a in a well planned way, and I think and that's I mean, what this money is for. Yeah. So I mean, I would love to see that money stay in, no matter what the budget looks like, because yeah. I think it's 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 very important. Um, I mean, the other point to make is that for people who 
don't pay any income tax, it's kind of irrelevant, but for people who do pay income tax, when you look at the amount of money that would be put back into people's pockets with a significant decrease in the income tax, it way more than covers what the town would need to raise in terms to um, get that, that revenue sharing back. Um, so, I mean, I, I saw the, the data. Scarborough in 2013, I believe, paid $36 million in income tax, Scarborough residents. And um, under this particular plan, they would save, I believe it's $10 million. $10 million coming back. And as Tom just said, revenue sharing is less than a million dollars. So that's a huge difference. Um, what we need to be careful is to make sure that we don't have the low income people and fixed income people be hurt by that because they're not paying income tax or they're paying very little in income tax. Would but the middle class is going to get hurt. Well, I think that depends on the sales tax credits and all of that stuff. Is that uh, analysis you just referred to something we could have? Sure. This is, yeah, this is actually, something yeah. that is based upon um, DAF figures, the Department of Administrative and Financial Services. Those are the, figures. Those are the figures I gave you uh, from the town hall, the LePage town hall. <coughs> so, um, does anybody have any other questions or, or statements on just looking at the clock? I just um, wanted to make one really quick yep, thing. Hey. Um, and I don't want to go, I'm sorry, I'd have to go backwards a little bit. We talked just briefly, talked about the, um, <clears throat> the charity side of things. And, um, you know, I know the governor's talked about looking into if you have charities in your town and taxing them and um, you know I'm at Mar the March of Dimes is located in the town of Scarborough and um, you know I've personally spoken to them and also to people that donate to some of those charities and when you start talking about taxing those charities people get a little upset about that and they don't necessarily, they may start pulling back on what they're donating and that's a real, that's a major concern for me is that some of these charities are actually going to get hit twice and I don't think, you know, I think that's something that we have to be very careful about. I mean, the charities are there for a reason. We need them. Um, a lot of people rely on some of these charities and I think it's something that we have to be careful about when we talk about taxing charities mm -hmm. and some towns don't even have right. charities. So then it's a whole nother, right. and, I, and I realize it's all preliminary and that stuff, but that's just something I feel really strongly about. I've worked with them for a very long time, and um, I know that it's very concerning to them, and, and they're, they're based on everything they do comes from donations. And when you start talking about taxing those donations, um, people start talking about not donating. Um. I guess that confuses me. It, fe it feels to me like if I had more money in my pocket, yeah. as a taxpayer, I would have more money to donate to a charity. I, and if I yeah. knew that they had tax liabilities on top of their other expenses, I would be more likely to support them. Mm -hmm. But um, I think even in the governor's proposal, it's completely optional. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that um, is I happening to me. No. Oh, it is a mandate. I'm sorry. And it's 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 only it it's only for the the nonprofits yeah. that are valued over five hundred thousand, and it exempts mm -hmm. it, it exempts mm -hmm. the the churches. Yeah. So, um, I I thought when I read it that it was optional for the no. for the no, it's, not. it's a mandate. Okay. Are veterans organizations going to be exempt? Yes. Yeah. Well, let, sorry, I don't. I don't. That's my understanding. Yes. I don't know. Had any we, we don't know yet. <laughs> but like, no, but on the original proposal it was. Like I get why that would be exempt, but you know, we're talking about veterans, but we're talking about babies. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about grieving parents and we're talking about veterans. I mean there's there's a pull for everything. Every there's a story behind everything. Absolutely. You know, and that's the hard part that you start to get into with this stuff. Well and, and related to that Sorry, I didn't mean to no, take it back. And, re <laughs> and related to that is <laughs> actually and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that part of this whole budget scenario and I understand God only knows what will end up being by May fifteenth. But is that there will be no more when I do my state income tax 
there will be no more uh, like my uh, right. mortgage okay. interest, my yeah. charitable deductions, and all so of these will go away. Then that may be part of yeah. where what you're thinking about there. Yeah, right. that's probably. So, I'm going to anyway. interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to interrupt to figure out one or two more things to hopefully. I do have one one question that's related yep. to that discussion. I'm sorry, but um, I, I was asked to co sponsor a bill that um, would allow municipalities, and that Representative Kathy Chase, that was our um, a chair of appropriations, I guess, I think in the 125th legislature, um, she had sponsored this legislation, and it just it wasn't. So it enabled municipalities to assess for services for nonprofits. Right. And so I don't know if that's something that again, that's not a mandate, that just enables them to do that because can we right already now. do can we already do that or because I know Portland Maine Med does a fee in lieu of payment in lieu of taxes. Yeah, that's but that's a volunteer. That's thing. more local authority okay. to it's enable that. Okay. It's more it's like what I'm sorry, it's like what Tom said. It's more yes. gives it okay. back to the town than so that is something that yeah. I'm, I'm thinking. I'd be interested. You would to be hear more, more interested in. If you ha I'd be interested to hear more about it when yeah. you. Just before we need the, the the budget discussion, this was a thorough review of revenue sharing. So you're referencing uh, income. Were there, is there another analysis that you were referring to? Uh, yeah, we, I don't have a copy of, uh, they did it down by town. I, oh, yeah. I, Tom, I have a, an entire report that I can email to you I'd, I'd that to has it. every single town in it. Right. So the last little leg of our resolution, and then we'll move on, is um, obviously, like I said, talked about the first few things. The last thing is encouraging that um, that we, we are given the opportunity to have the option of a local tax. That's, that's the last piece in our resolution for later. Um, again, you know, it's more in general for myself, interest of preserving options. You know, you know again, as you guys have all said, stated, you know, you know what pieces and what parts go through, what don't. Um, but the more options that locally we can preserve for, for ourselves to, to help offset some of these things, it's, 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 it's good. Um, so I want to make sure, even if we've at least touched on gaming, so <laughs> we've at least touched on it. We've, 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 we've talked about it a little bit. Um, I do want to make sure we talk about item number three, which is property tax assistance. Yeah. Um, there, um, and I'll, I'll put that back off to Tom in just, just a moment. Um, the, the one thing I do want to say is um, for, for myself with um, both parents and grandparents that live here in Scarborough and in homes. Um, one, one of the things I recently ran into is it can be somewhat difficult to, to get into that, especially again if you're elderly and you're not receiving an income. Um, so anything you can do to help streamline that process or offer alternatives of how to get themselves from the local level, mm. um, it depends on some, some actions and some, some statutes that you have on, on your level. So anything you can do to streamline that process, whether it's another proof of residency or income or, or something, um, but to streamline that a little bit would, would be beneficial. Okay. Um, if you don't file an income tax, and then you need to call this number, and, and it, it becomes more than it ought to be for somebody who's 80 plus years old. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and mm -hmm. the answer of get online and get the form to somebody 80 mm -hmm. plus years yeah. old. <laughs> yeah, that that yeah. doesn't work really. That doesn't quite right. work very well. Right. So, um, yeah, just two related matters, and, and I, I don't think we need much of any feedback. But yes, I think what uh, Councilor Holbrook mentions, we've heard a lot of feedback from residents that when the uh, circuit breaker program went away and was mm. replaced with this property tax fairness credit. It's cumbersome and very complicated, mm. and so there's a way to simplify that, and really? that's not something yeah. you can do. It's because they're we not. thought it was a, just. I mean, no. yeah, it's because they're not. They're not if filing they they're it. They're not filing. It is not. Yeah. Not. yeah. Uh, right. And if there are no so that's, that's just so feedback. And the other uh, <coughs> corollary to that, we choose to fund a local property tax assistance program, mm -hmm. and it piggybacks on that state program. Yeah. So eligibility for our program is based on eligibility for the state program. So that's where it really becomes important for us. The other piece we became interested in recently is perhaps extending that locally funded program to include folks uh, on fixed income with disability designation. Mm -hmm. Right now it's based on age and we're interested in exploring. What we found is the state law does not enable us to even consider mm -hmm. the disability aspect. So the ordinance committee has chosen to kind of shelve the issue. Yeah. It's not something I expect we can do in this session, but perhaps we can take this up at a later time. Yeah, we wanted mm -hmm. to, but as a percentage of Scarborough's population, how many? Um, 688. 
disabled? Our, our, I should say are currently qualified for SSDI, that's Federal Social Security Disability Payments. Mm -hmm. There's another other standards, but that's that's one I could think of. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that the diff there was so there was SSI and SSDI yeah. until mm -hmm. some, right. uh, some other things have been going on. But anyway, so those don't need to be the attention. That's kind of more feedback and maybe mm -hmm. something we can work on going forward. Yeah, any help you guys could give with that would be great. There may, I don't know whether there's a bill already right. submitted yeah, around this and, see, and mm -hmm. see if we can find something Sometimes like that. titles are hard to do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so we'll see when it's all fixed shape. Okay. So, I know, I'm, I'm like trucking a whip here, but it is something to do. <laughs> um, I, I do just want to wrap up with, um, I think this is great. This is beneficial. I, I hope we folks are bringing out of it as much as, as we're bringing out of it. Um, certainly, we'd love to maybe continue some communication mm -hmm. going forward. Um, certainly, if you have any ideas, I, I know it was hard for you to get away today. You, you, you were doing your, your job of an Augusta. Um, but, but certainly, you know, maybe if we could do this again at, at some mm -hmm. point, um, and I think it's beneficial just to have that right. workshop format of, hey, there's a problem here, can you help, and, and, and vice versa, explaining to us about some mm. of the stuff rolling down. So, yep. um, and not just for us, but for the people at home, I'm sure, sure are helpful. probably getting a lot out of this that we don't even realize. Right. Um, again, I just want to thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you for thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank so, you thanks for all you do. And we'll meet up for a week. That's this is the...